Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Titans of Healthcare podcast by Slice of Healthcare. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. We have such a great group today. Uh, I'm very excited. We have we have four people on, so I'm not even going to dig into intros. I'm going to let them each give their intros. We're going to start with Amit, and then we're going to go down the line. So it's going to be Amit, Joel, Will, and Corey, and I'll let them each give their, their, their full name, background, uh, and we'll start off after that. Kick it off, Amit. Sure thing, Jared. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and honor to be collaborating with you again, and uh, very nice to meet you all panelists. Thank you to the listeners. Uh, my name is Amit Garg. I am the co-founder, managing partner of Tau Ventures. We are an early stage VC fund headquartered in Palo Alto, in the heart of Silicon Valley. We do AI and healthcare, AI and enterprise. Uh, as of this recording, we are 85 million AUM, uh, assets under management. We have done 52 investments um, in the area of healthcare. We have looked a lot around cancer, how to diagnose it, how to treat it. We have looked a lot around chronic diseases in general, diabetes, obesity, mental health. And we look a lot around how to reduce paperwork. There's a ton of paperwork in this country. How do we get rid of the one trillion that we put in administrative costs? Uh, and underlying all of these themes is AI. We look for ways in which companies can leverage, deploy AI in a meaningful way. Uh, we started the firm just about four years ago. Uh, anybody interested in learning more, tauventures.com. Uh, thanks, Amit. Uh, I'm Joel Gotchberg. I'm the VP of Business Development for Clue Medical. My background is computer science and business. I've been working uh, in and with uh, critical care units, intensivists, critical care nurses, and other uh, allied health professionals in the critical care space for most of my adult life. In the last 17 years, I've been working in the tele-ICU or virtual critical care realm, uh, and uh, I've been with Clue Medical for three years. Excited to be with you. Great. Uh, my name is Will Hazard. Um, I am an intensivist. Uh, my background is in anesthesia, uh, did general critical care and a neurocritical care fellowship. So my primary engagement is uh, in the care of neurologically injured patients. I um, entered into a um, uh, fork in my career a couple of, well, just a little over a year ago, where I took over directorship of the um, virtual ICU uh, at Penn State Health. Um, so that's been ongoing for about a year, continuing to scale and, and um, make the product our own. So very excited to be here and thanks for having me. Thank you. And I am Corey Skurlock. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Equal Medical. I, I too, am an anesthesiologist and intensivist. Uh, I've been involved now in telehealth for the past 13 years, about 300 implementations of a variety of types of telehealth under my belt at this point. Uh, Equal Medical, we are an acute care telehealth services company. We are laser focused in the hospital space, whether that's ER, intensive care unit, med surge, or even post-acute. Uh, and we offer tele-ICU services as well as other telehealth-enabled services. So thank you for having me. Appreciate being here. Yeah, I'm really excited for this conversation. We'll we'll kick things back over to Amit, and then we'll go down the, the line again. But Amit, I'm going to start off with you. You know, how should we think of bottlenecks relative to hospitals and, and flow? Oh, my. <laughs> bottlenecks is the, perhaps the most diplomatic way of putting this, Jared. Um, so let me, let me take it one level above. Um, we come across just about 4,000 deals a year right now at Tau. We end up doing 10 or 12 of those as actual investments. And we look at team, we look at technology, we look at traction. But one of the key things really, especially at the seed stage, which is about core focus, is the go-to-market. And when you're dealing with healthcare, what the go-to-market really means is, will people actually use it? If you're going towards providers, will providers actually use the product? You can come up with the most incredible innovation. And if the doctor has to do an additional step in order to use the product, they're just not going to do it. Um, and we have several doctors on this call, and they can attest to this too. Providers have so much to do. And EMRs, there's a lot of controversy around them, whether they even save time for, for providers. So we pay specific attention in how does it fit in within the workflow of the provider. If you are uh, having to do extra steps, maybe you'll do it if it's mandated from the top, but otherwise, you, and you will do it grudgingly, um, but otherwise, you're just not going to use it. So we look, pay special attention. 
does this work does this fit into the workflow of the physician is the nurse going to be able to use this while they're walking through the halls of a hospital right if they have to go to a separate room in order to access a terminal maybe they won't use it understanding the patterns of your users that is a fundamental challenge that any business should be able to solve but i think in healthcare is especially critical because people see dangling in front of them this is a trillion dollar market and i go yes it is a trillion dollars but that one trillion is really freaking hard to get to and um the the key to getting that is understanding the challenges of your users we'll kick it over to you jill thanks Samit. there are a lot of obstacles um, to moving patients through their care processes and their their protocols um, there are missed connections or difficulties in getting caregivers to um, align in space and time in order to communicate you know, this is the next thing that has to happen before we can move that patient along to the next part of their journey or move them out of the hospital. And so it's very common that we see patients accumulate an extra day or two in the hospital when it might not have been necessary if we could have had better alignment uh, between the caregivers to move that process ahead. That's my perspective. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> As Amit said, that's a trillion dollar question and unfortunately one that doesn't have one solitary answer. Uh, bottlenecks in healthcare are both, uh, uh, you know, a, a human capital problem, patient disease, uh, payer mix, um, regulation. It, it, it is a very, very complex problem. And it's not just an inflow problem, it's an outflow problem. You know, so we have patients coming in, we can't move them through the system based upon level of care designations that we have. We have patients in those beds. So it's it's a very, very complex problem. What I look to is exactly what Ahmed said is, um, you know, I, I, I work a lot. Um, I spend a lot of hours doing paperwork, doing summaries, doing communication pieces to colleagues and to payers. Um, that takes me away from what I love and makes me not want to do what I love, which is care for patients. Um, so the, the need to address the provider's concerns is, I think, the utmost important. We'll make any system that does that relevant immediately. Unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of them miss the mark, right? Because they are spending less time than they probably should on the customer discovery process. And I kind of hate that word as it pertains to patients and the care of patients. But really, you need to address what's that pain point and how am I going to do it? Just saying AI is going to solve all the problems is shows a lack of insight. Um, but there is, in my opinion, a, a very, very, very real role for AI in the future. It just needs to adapt to what we need as customers, or our pain points. Yeah, I totally agree with what everyone said. I just add to that that I see patient flow and bottlenecks as a central problem of acute care telemedicine. And when I talk about patient flow, I mean, in a number of different ways. I'm talking about, yes, getting the right patient, the right care at the right place at the right time. Um, but I'm also talking about load balancing across healthcare systems. What I see is there's been a ton of mergers and acquisitions of healthcare systems. And when you look at that, there's a the classic hub and spoke model. And what we see is the hub is relatively overloaded with patients, maybe even patients who are too low acuity. And then the spoke hospitals are relatively underloaded. And that's due to lack of staffing. And telehealth enabled services can help with that. The other concept I see of flow is really pulling the patient through the healthcare system as safely and as rapidly as possible at the lowest cost in the lowest cost area. And so what I really mean by that is pulling the patient from the ER once they've been admitted into the hospital. We know from the medical literature that every hour the patient waits in the ER after they've been admitted there's a proportional increase in length of stay and mortality, and telehealth services can rapidly overcome that. Pulling them out of the transfer center so they don't get lost to the healthcare system is really important. And then, you know, as they're admitted, shrinking their length of stay in the ICU so the ICU is running 24-7, uh, minimizing their complications, using clinical decision support tools to make sure you hit best practices, to make sure that the patient's being optimally cared for, whether it's the middle of the day or the middle of the, the evening. And then finally, moving their discharge times to earlier in the morning so that the patients can leave the hospital more rapidly and there's a net capacity increase. You know, I think what the U.S. healthcare system really needs is not more beds. They need to invest in their people and process. And 
And telehealth is really a version of that. And what we try to do is bring change management to that aspect, but using clinical tools to do it. We're going to quickly stay on with you, Corey, because you, you said it a few times, right? <laughs> telehealth. So talk us through today. How, how are hospitals leveraging telehealth to respond to some of the challenges that you mentioned? And then we'll go opposite order for, for this one. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, sort of being in telehealth now 13 years, and I certainly, you know, it was already existing before I got in it. We're now in our 25th year since the first tele-ICU was invented in 1998. It now encompasses 33% of all ICU beds. So it's been tremendous growth. If you look at telehealth, where it's been and where it's going, in my opinion, how hospitals are using it, you can break it down into two distinct phases. There is the pre-COVID era in which telehealth was growing at a 300% annual rate, but really was dependent on early adoption. And then you had this period of COVID in which telehealth grew at a 2,000% annual rate, which is really unsustainable, but was changed the adoption curve. Um, What's really important in that is that when healthcare systems embraced it, they faced real crises. They faced what was right in front of them. And they said, hey, you know, I have a I have a problem and I want telehealth to solve it, meaning, hey, maybe my ICU is not working. So I want a tele ICU solution or my med surge area is not working. Well, I want a telehospitalist solution. And they bought single vendor, single partner of choice. And what I think is now going on as we emerge from COVID is that hospitals are looking for a partner in a platform that can help them across the whole venue from admission to discharge. They want something that's flexible, that's scalable, that's modular, that allows them to innovate. And they want a partner who can help them along that whole pathway. And I think the same is true in technology as in staffing. And so again, I will go back to that whole patient flow concept. That is a win, win, win. It's a win for the patients because they get the best care possible in, in the most local environment. It's a win for the hospitals because it's financially very viable. And then finally, it's a win for our healthcare system. It's it's really helping to reduce costs across it. So that's where I see telehealth going. And that's where I see telehealth really where we've been. You know, I agree with everything that Corey has said. M&A has changed the landscape of health systems. Um, Long are gone are the days where it's a single hospital and a single input and output of patients. Now it's, you know, as you said, large swaths of hospitals joining forces to compete against larger and larger health systems. We face some of the same things and we are looking to telehealth um, to adapt to a changing climate, changing patient flow. Um, And as Corey said, it's not sustainable just to start building more buildings, more hospitals, That's and, and more importantly, probably than the actual Brick and mortar is the human capital expenditure that goes along with all the support staff that gives a service line. Um, so we are using telehealth in a way that you know may, maybe is not novel, but I think is quite obvious in that we can break down geographical boundaries um, by leveraging uh, AB support. Um, so we can bring our consultants to patients uh, that are in community hospitals without moving those patients out of their community. It's incredibly costly and it's a, frankly, it's a dissatisfier for patients. And in a majority of the time, not all the time, it's unnecessary. It is a simple conversation, but the, the consultant physician needs a better understanding of the patient other than a phone call, um, which which is not which is not the way to take good care of patients. So, so I think, you know, I, I agree wholeheartedly telehealth won't be the only solution. And it's, it's not, you know, you're basically using your human capital, your expertise in a different way. Uh, you're, you're not getting rid of it, but you're allowing them to be much more efficient. I call it, you know, making full use of the FTE, whereby if you put someone in a community hospital that's highly trained and he or she sees two patients per month, you're not using that person to the fullest extent. And, and we as physicians and advanced practitioners and providers are incredibly expensive if we're not used efficiently. I, I agree with everything Corey and Will said. Um, I think t- to add to this, um, w- we need to understand coming out of the pandemic, there's gonna be a very rapid evolution of these platforms and the AI models. And although the pandemic forced us to make some pretty big changes in a short period of time, 
change is not going anywhere, <laughs> right? Uh, we're going to have to continue to adapt. And we're seeing that with our own platform. Uh, we, we put out a new release every six weeks. Uh, so um, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll be able to do it at a pace that's sustainable for um, uh, health care providers to keep up with. Uh, but it's not just us. It's coming from everywhere. Very rapid evolution here. I'm, I'm echoing what everybody else has said, but let me point out uh, on that point around change. The challenge is not technology. Like this is telehealth, 25 plus years that we, we could have done this. The, the challenge is us as people. It's us uh, adapting to, to these new modes of communication. It's us having the right set of regulation and processes. Uh, I'll give one very specific example that I go through. Uh, whenever I call my, my physician, they say, well, you are going to do telehealth. Make sure you're in California. You cannot take this call if you're not in California. So they're like, okay, so if I happen to be out of state because I'm for work or vacation or whatever, I can't do this. Like it boggles my mind. I understand why the regulation exists, but the regulation is outdated in today's world. And every single time they remind me, make sure you're in California. If you're not in California, you have to unschedule it. They actually even call me before the telehealth consultation. Hi, we just wanted to check in that you're actually in California. I go like, you're calling me to confirm about a telehealth consult. Like, how bizarre is that? Um, and, and it's not their fault. It's not the provider's fault. It's because fundamentally there were rules that were created based on technologies and processes that are so outdated at this point. Uh, I'll, I'll take another example sort of related to this. Um, I wanted to go to a physician that was in a different network. And they said, yeah, give us their fax number. I said, like, fax, like, what is that? I, I, I've, I've heard of tablets. Like, do you need me stone tablets so I can add, add something and send it to them? Like, we have all these processes that are so outdated at this point, makes physicians go crazy. And I think all three of you here on the call with me, you can attest to this. The, the, the people say that medicine is a calling. It really has to be a calling for you to be able to deal with the insanity that exists in healthcare. Absolute insanity. Um, and I think telehealth is part of the solution. I'm a huge believer in it. Like, bring me the telehealth. Let me talk to everybody I want telehealth. And when I need to go and speak to a physician in person, I will. But that's not the panacea for all, all of our issues. Uh, our issues are of ourselves. Like, we need to create better systems around it. Staying staying on uh, you, Amit, I want to really focus in on uh, really talking through AI is more than just a buzzword, right? I know it's not a buzzword for, for the people that are actually, you know, utilizing it, but for many in the industry, it seems like a lot of people throw it. You can probably attest to this on it. They throw it in their oh, deck. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's like blockchain was a, a couple of years back, right? You throw it in as a, to, to get interest. Um, and then you, you quickly on your end, see whether it's a, a buzzword for them or they're actually using it. But I would love to focus in on how do we break down facts and results from promise as it relates to AI and, and you know, AI's role in telehealth and what we're using uh, it within health systems for. Yep. Um, a great question. We're an AI first fund. We started uh, in 2019 before AI came into global consciousness. Uh, we always expected it to. It actually happened quicker than we expected it to. Um, and let me actually illustrate with stories. So one of our investments Coincidentally, our very first investment officially through the fund is a company called Iterative Health. And I'm simplifying things a little bit, but they use computer vision to detect colon cancer. So while you're doing a colonoscopy, in real time, you're getting a video feed and the video feed is analyzed by the algorithms and they draw a yellow rectangle saying, oh, there's a polyp, let's go pay attention. And once again, simplifying things a little bit here, but even the best physicians today can see 75% of the time that there's a polyp because they're small, they're hidden in the folds of your intestine. Uh, you can't use non-invasive methods of imaging. This company at the time of invested was able to get to 99% detection. Now let, let's just stop there for a second. 75 to 99%, that is literally saving 24 more lives potentially out of a hundred. Early detection is the key for early treatment. Early treatment is the key for basically saving somebody's life. Um, and the key result we saw there it's not that you're just using AI for the sake of using AI. You were able to drive a very meaningful change here. It's not just 1% or 2% better. It's significantly better. And even 1% or 2%, by the way, in a population of 7 billion human beings, that goes a long way. 
Like if you are part of that 1% improvement, you really want that AI. So what we see AI is, yes, there are platforms that are getting created right now to do AI, but what's especially interesting for us is applying that AI. If you, you don't need to be a PhD in machine learning at this point to take what has been built by many other people, large companies and small companies, and apply it to solve a problem. In the case of iterative health, they didn't develop the computer vision, somebody else did. They didn't develop the hardware, somebody else did. What they did is put it all together, analyze it towards the problem that they understood really well, and drive a very meaningful change. And th this company incidentally has not raised over $200 million. So it's, it's the kind of journey that we see possible with, with AI. Fast growth, fast scaling, really big, meaningful results. Right, but that, that fast growth that might happen in the very near future, the work started a long time ago. In our, in our case, eight years ago. And, and doing this and doing it right is really hard. And then doing it well enough to actually earn an FDA clearance for it is harder still. So we're very excited to have been able to do those things. I wish I could take some credit for it. My colleagues have brilliantly pulled this off, but it's really hard to do well. I'm starting to see now in my work, which is honestly selling virtual critical care or, or acute telehealth to, to uh, health systems, that there's a new element to the process where we're getting quizzed on exactly how we built our AI platform, how we validated it, how we tested it. Are we using unbiased data in the machine learning training? How do we know it's going to work as well with an Asian group or an African-American group or a Caucasian group? Um, um, things of that nature. We're starting, it's very early. I would say one out of every five prospects that I engage with is starting to ask really sophisticated questions around the AI construction and validation and bias. Um, but I think that that is an area that we're going to need to see uh, an improvement on uh, in order for health systems to know that the AI that they're going to be employing actually will do the job it's supposed to do. And the other thing um, that I think we'll also need to see is we're all, me included, all needing to brush up on concepts around positive predictive value and precision and things like that. Because when we build these models, we specifically tune the PPV to have it make sense in the workflow and also to catch the things you want to catch without creating excessive noise. Uh, and so, and, and one of the things we do is identifying patients who might not need to be in the ICU, but with pretty high precision, we have to get that right. Because Will doesn't want to discharge somebody from an ICU that we said looks pretty good, only to have them bounce back four or five hours later. Yeah, this is, um, th this is a complex question. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, the example that Emmett gave is a great one, but considering computer vision is probably 20 years old, um, you know, it kind of tells you what the runway is. I think the runway has been shortened considerably uh, with LLM moving into generative pre-trained transformers. That, that is changing the world. Uh, whether we like it or not. It just makes something that's fundamental to a specific problem um, and moves it to being able to solve um, not one problem, but tens of thousands of problems using the same language modeling. Um, I'm incredibly excited about uh, generative AI, much more so, I think, than, um, than you know, supervised learning um, and uh, weighting per, um, uh, key elements. Um, so, so yes, I, I'm excited about uh, the, the future of this. Um, the, one of the main problems with this is also the scalability. Um, it's phenomenal that you can pick up 25% more polyps. The clinical significance of that, significance of that, and the ROI of that is could be questioned in that, you know, screening colonoscopies may or may not improve survival or disease-free survival. So I think the more that we try to focus in on one problem, um, the more likely we are to kind of miss the big picture, which is, you know, we, we have a lot of things that need solving and creating a model for each one of them, there's no way that that will bend the needle in a meaningful way in the future. So uh, that's kind of a, a not, directly answering your question, uh, 
but um, but yeah, I think there's there's still work to be done. Yeah, I think you. I think Joel really hit it on the head, which is you know we need AI programs that are completely accurate, and, and the reason why we need them is really two unstoppable forces. One is the manpower shortage or you know personnel shortage that will occur and is occurring right now in healthcare. And the other driving force is the aging population. So if you look at the uh, manpower issues we have right now, it's now 20 years plus since the original compact study came out, which looked at manpower in the ICU. And we are just at the beginning of the iceberg on that. Um, Critical care workforce shortages are well documented. They're expected to continue. People aren't going into the field like they were 20 years ago. And on the flip side, the aging population is really driving demand for critical care resources and hospital resources. And when you turn over 65, you start using the ICU at five times the rate, 75, seven times the rate, 85, 10 times the rate. Couple that with the nursing shortage we're at as well, which is largely driven by burnout and baby boomer retirement. We're not going back to having the manpower and, and personnel that we had prior to COVID. So we'll need every tool, whether it's telehealth or telehealth plus AI, to help solve this crisis, and we need them rapidly. So we're, you know, we're our healthcare system has to embrace these types of tools and has to find a way to work with these tools to really scale our current workforce to solve problems twenty four seven. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, I would love to to kick things. We're we're going to talk a little bit as we as we start to wrap up here a, a little bit. Uh, how hospitals should think about virtual care. We're going to change the order up a little bit to to kind of kick off some some initial conversations differently. Uh, it's going to go Will, Corey, Joel, and Amit, and then we'll switch it up one more time to to wrap up with one last question. Uh, so so Will, how should hospitals be thinking more about virtual care? Yeah, well, is 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 Corey uh, aptly? Uh, said w- there are fewer and fewer and fewer resources available, not just human capital resources, but but also um, you know uh, capabilities within the individual hospitals. Um, virt- virtual care uh, not only should but has to play a part of it. And again, you can't hire the necessary FTEs. Uh, take for example, we we have a large telestroke program. Um, you you can't hire. Um, a four vascular trained neurologist for a community hospital that may see less than 100 ischemic strokes in a year. You cannot do that. It's not cost effective. Um, so, so virtual health needs to be looked upon as, as being able to, to, to layer support on existing infrastructure, uh, to be able to build that chain of transfer uh, and appropriate transfer, but also at the same, you know, we, we, we struggle a lot with these community hospitals having the necessary case mix index and case mix index is, is has how sick those patients are. And a lot of the reimbursement is based upon the illness for which the patient is being admitted for. So if your admission only includes congestive heart failure exacerbations, community acquired pneumonia, it's unlikely that that hospital will have enough incoming um, reimbursement to maintain keeping the doors open. So there just has to be a way of providing care for sick patients at, at a community hospital. And I think that's one thing that virtual care has done well in the past, but will now take over a lot of that. Hey, we're going to hire this individual. They're going to be on call 24-7. They're going to stay here for a year after their initial bonus compensation package goes away, and then they're gone because they don't want to work 24-7, 365. So, so that's the way I see virtual care really continuing to play a larger and larger and larger role, mostly at the spokes, um, if you will, as, as Corey said. There's a place for virtual care, even in more hub facilities, um, at least that's been my experience uh, looking back over data results on, on the use of these programs, even in organizations that were adequately staffed or even uh, premium staffing with seven by 24 intensivists. Uh, programs like this were actually able to demonstrate results in terms of reductions in mortality and length of stay in ICUs, even where there was seven by 24 intensivist care. Um, and and th- because when you're the, you're the one intensivist in the unit. If you have a crisis or two on your hands, that's really all you have time to manage. But there are other patients who need care as well. 
So one of the things I've seen over my career is um, some organizations who were very, very well staffed saying, we don't need this here. And then maybe they were, they were right. But the other thing that they were missing, and this is what Corey has done, is they've taken that expertise uh, and they have now applied it across a, a broader population of patients uh, using telehealth. So um, I, I still see a lot of potential growth for telehealth and folks getting involved in it who might not have thought that they needed it, but they actually have a contribution to make. Um, and and I, I hope that they will do that. Um, so that that's um, that's my sense of it, and I'm seeing greater and greater acceptance of it as not bedside care or telehealth care, but it's a hybrid model that encompasses both, and that's just the way we take care of patients now. It involves some physical and some virtual. Yeah, you both are absolutely right in the fact that you know telehealth is here to stay. Telehealth is now health, and hybrid care is often the way it's done. Um, if you look at the largest growing segment of telehealth, it's academic medical centers. So there, I think there is benefit at both the hub and the spoke, and both are expecting shortages and both face flow-based issues. You know, I think if you think of the three pillars of telehealth, people, process, technology, you want to pick the right technology that allows you to scale and gives you accurate predictions. And then on the people process side, you want a partner who can help de-risk the implementation of this. This is a big CapEx and OpEx outlay. You want to get it right the first time. You don't want to stub your toe and you want to build on early credibility. So having a partner who can de-risk that for you, optimize it, drive care standardization across your network, chase the KPIs that you're wanting to chase is critically important. Um, as much as it's a technology issue, this is a people issue, as Ahmed pointed out, and we have to have the right people. And those people have to have the right processes, and those processes have to be re-examined frequently to make sure they're adhering to what the KPIs and what the goals, strategic goals of the organization are. And just to put it in perspective here, look, 300 years ago, I wanted healthcare. I would go get a shave and have some leeches be put on me, right? I would go to my barber. A hundred years ago, a physician would show up to my door, would put a stethoscope, and give me a diagnosis, and they might say, "Oh, yeah." It's just because of bad air. Uh, they might not even know germ theory. Um, doesn't scale. That model, by the way, of the physician visiting you at home doesn't scale when you have a 330 million person country, which is where this country, United States, is now. Um, we went through fee-based service. We went through bundled payments. We went through all these different mechanisms, right? They're all just different ways of optimizing based on our population, our dynamics, our processes, et cetera. The current incarnation is probably not the last incarnation, but it is virtual first, value-based, with a big component of hybrid. Big mouthful to say, we will treat you either through Zoom or in person whenever you need, as you need. We'll do whatever makes most sense. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example of a portfolio company of ours called Renee.com. Um, and I think, Jared, you know them quite well. Uh, they are creating a personal digital assistant for the elderly, exactly the people who incurred the highest levels of healthcare costs, the people between 65, 75, and eventually 85 who need a lot of healthcare resources. What if we were able to give them the tools? They know how to schedule their appointments. It's scheduled for them. They know what medications to take. It shows up as reminders. They know how to navigate this immense bureaucracy that healthcare is. What if, and this is a pipe dream of mine, we actually had healthcare rather than sick care. What if they could do preventive care rather than actually getting the heart attack the app actually helps them prevent getting that heart attack. That would be a dream. So I, I think that AI, telehealth, all of these things are very powerful tools for us to eventually get there. My goal would be for all five of us to be out of jobs <laughs> on this call. Seriously. Give me a few years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think we'll get that in many lifetimes. But I would be stoked as hell if we were all out of jobs. <laughs> You say that now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so I, I've really enjoyed this conversation here today. I want to go down. Uh, we'll start with Joel. Uh, we'll do, uh, do Joel, Amit, Will, and Corey. Final thoughts in terms of what, what can these hospitals be doing as an action? Let, let's, let's give one action each, if that's cool. 
and that's how we'll wrap up here. Okay, well, thanks, Jared, again, for the opportunity to be here. Really appreciate it. I would say the one thing hospitals can do is to accelerate the development of their strategies for creating these hybrid care models. The pandemic showed you can get things done if you really focus on it. Health systems traditionally move very, very slowly, but they've shown that they can move fast when they need to. I think they need to. So that would be my my uh, my input. Move move quickly. Don't drag it out. Yeah, that's uh, so. So I I, I think um, being proactive in medicine is not our strong suit. Uh, we tend to be a reactive. Um, we tend to be reactive, and I think the days of being able to react to things like a you know international pandemic, um, you know labor shortages, um, I think those days are long gone. We need to be proactive, and to do so, we need to um, um, you know be early adopters, not on technologies that that are expensive and underperforming, but we need to do our due diligence to ensure that we're we as the global we um, are getting stuff that really moves the needle forward. And I think, um, you know, AI will at some point, um, I think there's a lot of fanfare that's associated with it and we cannot overlook the need uh, for increased training, um, increasing numbers of residency spots, increasing uh, reimbursement structure that's fair and equitable throughout different specialties. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, not all will be solved by AI, not all will be solved by virtual health but some of it does have to be uh, out of necessity. So, you know, hospitals now are emerging out of COVID. You know, during that two-year period, patients didn't get the care they needed, a lot of the preventative care and elective care they needed. That caused an accumulation of what I'll call a care debt, which has pushed hospitals, both in terms of their workforce and their operating margins. What I would say to hospitals now is it's a really great time to look at how you reorganize and redeploy your workforce and how you can use technology perhaps to achieve better financial results with maybe superior quality results and also optimizing your staff's performance and satisfaction. And I think, you know, layering in telehealth, layering in AI into what they're doing across all their venues is a really smart way to come out of this pandemic and to be strategically ahead of your competitors. Uh, Jared, I'm going to be a little tongue in cheek here. You said only one thing. If you had told me I could say multiple things, I would have said, allow physicians to unionize so that they can defend their rights and do the right thing. Allow, get rid of fax machines. Like just get rid of them, just throw them away. Just break them all down. Um, don't use HIPAA as a shield to not be able to do interoperability and communication and privacy for, uh, for, for patients in the right way. I would have said, don't spend $2 billion making a hospital pretty and nice, actually pay your people well. Um, because we as patients think that all these healthcare folks are getting paid a lot. That's not true. It's actually a lot of it is just being wasted through inefficiencies in the system. I would have said, create open innovation arms so that you can actually engage with startups and with innovation at its rawest. If it's not ready for commercial prime time, at least you start integrating and guiding that innovation. I would have said all of those things. But since you asked me to say only one thing, my one thing would it be create more interoperability. How come that banks can talk to each other, our computers can talk to each other? I can order my food from any restaurant in the freaking world, in the other side of the world, using my phone, but I cannot get my healthcare documents in a timely fashion when I need it, where I need it, to be able to share it, and I have to sign 10 pages of forms of don't this have a fax that? Like... <laughs> I don't have, well, I actually do have a fax machine, uh, and, and I actually know what a fax is, and it's not secure. This whole argument, excuse my French, is absolute bullshit. A fax, like, lies printed, and anybody can pick it up, like, it's not secure. Um, this, so anyways, my, my argument is interoperability of data, I think, would create a lot more competition in a healthy way would allow patients to be more empowered, would allow physicians to be able to get the right sets of data when they need it, and would make the system more transparent. I, for one, would actually know how much I need to pay when I go get something. Because the answer I hear is, we'll get back to you in three days after we have done 10 calls. I'll just quickly add the, the, the funny conversation around facts is last year at health, uh, at the health conference, or HLTH, uh, someone, a company, uh, was it Credo, Credo, 
they actually hosted one of those like anger room sessions where you could take a bat to a fax machine and just have a blast. Office which space. was pretty cool. Office I didn't get to go, but yeah, yeah, office space. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, well, everyone, thank you so much for, for joining me here again. Uh, really appreciate it and uh, look forward to staying in touch with all of you. Thank you. Thank you for having thank me. You.